Welcome back to Light and Logic, where we hope to spread both the light and the logic of Christ. I am Ashley, and this week's episode I'm very excited about. <laughs> uh, last week on Instagram and then on YouTube, I posted a poll, and this poll was on the person that I'd most like to have dinner with if I could pick any historical character. I think my choices were um, the Apostle Paul, Martin Luther, John Calvin, yeah, John Calvin, and Mary, Mother of Jesus. I had a wide ver wide variety of um, people choose different things. I think all of them were, like, pretty equal, except for Mary, Mother of Jesus. Uh, the person that we're going to be talking about today is Martin Luther. I would love to sit down with Martin Luther and also his wife, probably, uh, and just talk to them. I feel like Martin Luther's life r reads, like, it's not even real. Like, it's just, he lived such a crazy life. I would love to see his entire life turn into a movie. I know part was turned into a movie. Um, it's just the things that this man went through is crazy. So today I'm going to talk about five of my favorite facts surrounding Martin Luther. I, I feel like I have a lot of fun facts surrounding Martin Luther, but I just pick five. I don't know if it's really my favorite, but it is five facts. So anyway, without further ado, we'll hop into it. These are in no particular order, by the way, but number one is Luther was not into getting married, but then he married an ex-nun. So, the thing about Martin Luther is um, he started out as a Catholic monk, and it was through studying the Bible, particularly Romans, I believe, that led him to believe that what the Catholic Church was teaching at the time, especially uh, regarding indulgences, but also a couple other things, was not biblically correct, and the way that the Church handled justification and sanctification wasn't correct either. And so, the as the story goes, he nailed 95 Theses to the door, started this whole reformation within um, the church. He was excommunicated, blah, blah, blah. We'll get to that in a little bit. Anyway, so monks, they don't get married. And for a long time, Luther was opposed to getting married. Um, in November 1524, he actually wrote that he, like, was not about to get married, like, he was not interested in it, but then by May of 1525, he was engaged to be married to a woman, and then in June of that same year, he was married. So his views shifted very radically within a very short time. One of the reasons um, that he decided that marriage was something that he was called to was to spite the devil, among other things. He had preached to others that they should get married, that most everyone should get married, except for very specific circumstances. And then he realized that he himself was not married, and then he was like, well, I, I'm not called to singleness, so I should probably get married. So anyway, um, Luther married this ex-nun named Catherine von Bora, and he was 41 or 42, and she was 26 scandal. The fact that Luther married an ex-nun, I laugh about it all the time. It's like the scandal to end all scandals in that time. The way that the story goes is there was this convent who got their hands on some of Martin Luther's writings, and they decided that they wanted to leave the convent. They were inspired by the Reformation and wanted to take part of that, but they were in this convent. And so Luther and some other guys helped to get these nuns out of the convent by smuggling them in, like, a covered wagon among, like, uh, barrels of fish, I believe. It was, like, barrels of something kind of nasty. But they literally smuggled them out of this convent. Luther helped to place all of these nuns with husbands, so he, he um help them because in that time women didn't have very many rights and so it was basically you had a man or you suffered <laughs> kind of thing or you were in the convent you were either married or in the convent one of the two anyway um so all these nuns he got married off they were in homes but there's just one left Catherine von Bora and Luther had set up several suitors for her but she was not having it she only wanted to marry Luther and like I said Luther was not here for that he did not want to get married but finally he's like oh, okay I'll get married to this lady um, because he felt called to marriage. My very favorite part of the story is that even though Luther at first married her kind of to spite the devil, he ended up loving her very, very deeply. It's very evident in his writings how deeply he loved her. Uh, he had a lot of different, um, nicknames for her. Sorry, I love talking about Luther. <laughs> He's so funny. Um, he had a lot of different nicknames for her. One he called his rib, or he called her his rib, um, and that mirrors the story of the Garden of Eden, God taking, uh, Eve, or creating Eve out of one of Adam's ribs, and so uh, linking that close relationship there. 
Um, he also called her boss of Zuzeldorf because of how she took care of the home. Boss of Zuzeldorf, that is so funny. He called her the morning star of Wittenberg because of how early she got up. He also called her, um, my lord or my master Katie, kind of tongue-in-cheek because of how she managed the estate and other things so well. And then my favorite is he called her my Katie. How cute. What a love bug. One really interesting thing that I learned, um about this story is that Luther actually named Katie his sole inheritor after he passed away. Um, but it wasn't legal. The court ruled that it wasn't legal after he died because women weren't supposed to be the sole inheritor. So he loved her so much that he did that. Um, and had so much faith in her that he named her the sole inheritor. I just think that's really cool. That leads me to number two, which is Luther's wife. We've discussed that, um, she was an ex nun. She didn't want to marry these men. She ended up marrying um, Luther, and she was kind of a baddie. Like, she had so many things going for her. I love Katie. She ran the home. She ran a small farm. She had this pond that people could fish out of. Um, she also had livestock. And along with that, she had six children of her own, took in orphans, and was often one to host um, people that needed a, a long-term place to stay in their home. So Katie was a Proverbs 31 woman, let me tell you. So that's all great, but my two favorite Katie stories have to deal with her relationship with Luther. The first one is um, Luther had a tendency to get depressy, and so this one time he was in a mood, and she came into the room wearing mourning clothes, and he was like, oh my gosh, who died? And she looked at him and said, well, God must have died by the way that you're acting. Oh my, that is so funny. So that's my first story. The second story is that... <laughs> Um, when Luther was in another one of his moods, he had locked the door, so it was, like, bolted shut, and what she, like, she couldn't get into him. So what she did is she took the hinges off the door, just removed the door completely and got into the room where he was. <laughs> what, like, she's so funny. Okay, moving on from Katie, we have number three, which is Luther's stage kidnapping in disguise. So several years after Lucid, Lucid? After Luther posted the 95 Theses on the church door, he was called to give an account for what he said at this thing called the Diet of Worms, which was basically just a meeting of the, the Roman Empire. So all the huge people in the Roman Empire came there to discuss what Luther had done and to discuss what they do with him if he didn't recant. Um, they discussed some other things, but that was the main thing. He wouldn't do this. There's this famous line that's attributed to Luther, and it says, My conscience is captive by God. I can do no other. Here I stand. And that here I stand part is debated. If, it, if he actually said that, he probably didn't. But anyway, it's very famous. Here I stand. During that time, you couldn't just go against the Roman Catholic Church. They were the ruling authorities. And so to pit yourself against uh, the Roman Empire was to bring death upon yourself. Like, we don't do that back then. So after the Diet, after Luther wouldn't um, recant his statements, the Diet decided that they should arrest Luther, and it wasn't, he never was arrested, but they decided that that should be done. Instead, um, on Luther's way home, he was fake kidnapped. So I actually don't know if Luther was in on this kidnapping. I assume that he was, but he didn't just like fade into the darkness of night. He literally like this kidnapping was staged for him um, by this friend, um, Frederick III of Saxony. So good old Freddy took him back to the Wartburg Castle, and Luther remained hidden for about nine months. Um, my favorite part of this story is that this time he went as uh, Junker Jorg. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm actually going to look up how that's said. Okay, I said it totally wrong. It's Younger Jorg. <laughs> I think that's how it's said. Anyway, it's German, and so the, the J is a little weird. But anyway, he went into hiding as this knight, named that name. Um, and what his disguise was, or I should back up, it meant Knight George. So that's what his name meant in German, Knight George. And his disguise was literally growing out a beard and his hair. There's actually a picture. I'll put up, like, the most famous picture of him and then this one where he was Knight George. They're so funny to look at. So his disguise was literally that he was in this castle for nine months. People actually assume that he died because you just kind of assume that you're, this kidnapping isn't staged. You assume that he probably died. Anyway, he was... Uh, gone for nine months, and during this time, he didn't just, like, lay there and suffer. He actually translated the entire New Testament Bible into German. That's a productive nine months, if I do say so myself. No, no big deal, just translating the entire New Testament. Okay, moving on to number four, which is Luther's small catechism. One of Luther's most famous works is this small catechism. It covers the basis of baptism, the Lord's Supper, um, Holy Communion, uh, the Apostles, not the Apostles, yeah, the Apostles' Creed, I believe, and then also uh, the Ten Commandments and a little bit things interspersed. He published this book in 
1529, after he, he visited this local congregation, this is what Luther had to say about his experience in the local congregation. The deplorable, miserable conditions which I recently observed in visiting the parishes have constrained and pressed me to put this catechism of Christian doctrine into this brief, plain, and simple form. How pitiable, so help me God, were the things I saw. The common men, especially in the villages, knows practically nothing of Christian doctrine, and many of the pastors are almost entirely incompetent and unable to receive the holy sacraments, even though they do not know our Father, the creeds, or the Ten Commandments, and live like poor animals of the barnyard and pig pen. What these people have mastered, however, is the fine art of tearing all Christian liberty to shreds. Wow, <laughs> that's some strong words for what he saw. Anyway, a big tenet of the Reformation is that anyone is able to understand scripture on his or her own. In that time, people didn't have the Bible in their own language. That's part of the reason. Well, that's the reason that Luther translated it, um, the New Testament, to German. And so they had to rely on the church for their information. But they weren't, the church wasn't doing, the Roman church wasn't, the Roman Catholic Church, geez, was not doing a very good job at that time of teaching what scripture said. Um, and so Luther took it upon himself to translate the New Testament and also provide families with this uh, small catechism. So the the intention behind that was that fathers would teach it to their children. You literally just read the script off and it tells you what all these things mean. Pretty cool. Okay, final thing. Number five is the Luther insult generator. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite things ever in the entire world, and I share it every day on Reformation Day, which is October 31st. Um, Luther was a very spicy guy. He thought that the Pope was the Antichrist. Hi, Wallace. Sorry, my dog walked in the room. Um, he thought that the Pope was the Antichrist, and the Pope thought that he was the Antichrist. And so he had some um, rather interesting exchanges with the Pope and also other individuals, as you saw from that quote above. Luther was not afraid to speak his mind. And so um, anyway, th in this URL, you can hit refresh, and it'll give you like an insult that Luther put out. It's so hilarious. Like I just love going through them and reading them. Um, we don't pretend that Luther is a saint. He's not. He's an imperfect man. We don't worship Luther. He is just a man that brought um, the Bible to common people, and he had a lot of good things to say about what was going on in the church at that time and the way that he flushed out um, doctrine in a way um, that was easily digestible and accurate to scripture is really important to us. Anyway, all that to say, Luther did sin, and he was he acknowledged his sin. He knew that he was a sinner. So anyway, um, laugh at these things that he said. Um, I'll put it down in the URL, and I think I can put it up here. Anyway, if I'm having a bad day, I go on Luther Insult Generator, and it pick, picks my spirits up right away. That is all for today. I want to know if you could pick anyone from history to eat dinner with. Who would you pick and why? Put it in the comments down below. Um, also, please like and subscribe if you feel so inclined. It helps boost our channel. Other than that, thanks so much for tuning in today, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye!